This is Visionary, a show exploring how nuclear powers your world. I'm Mary Carpenter. And I'm Jordan Houghton. Let's jump in. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for the very first episode of Visionary. I'm Mary Carpenter, and I'm the Director of Digital and Content Strategy at the Nuclear Energy Institute. And I'm Jordan Houghton. Senior Media Relations Manager at the Nuclear Energy Institute. Mary, I am so excited to kick off this podcast with you. Me too. And we've been talking about starting a podcast for some time now. And really what we're hoping to showcase with this show is just how much our world will benefit from nuclear energy. I think that in our day-to-day job as nuclear communicators, we're seeing a need to reach a broader audience to talk about the benefits of nuclear from energy security to climate change benefits. And this is going to be a great opportunity to offer up nuclear in an accessible, mostly non-technical way. As communicators, we're we're always looking for ways to make it easy for non-scientists and engineers to understand the benefits of nuclear energy. Yeah, and I think that's important to share now that Jordan and I are not nuclear engineers. We are both communicators. I grew up in my career working on Capitol Hill for a member from Georgia where the first advanced reactor is coming online in the United States. So we have a lot of excitement around nuclear and I was well aware of its benefits and how important it was going to be. And my background is in public relations. I've done PR and media relations for several decades in a variety of industries, not necessarily just nuclear. I've been kind of all over the place, but became passionate about nuclear several years ago while I was leading outreach and education for the National Atomic Testing Museum in Las Vegas. And working there gave me the opportunity to interact with members of the public of all ages. I'm a mom to two young kids myself, and climate change is something that's so important to me because we're all dealing with it now, but the next generations are going to have to deal with it in different ways than even we are. And I would love to help contribute to making it a better place for them. And since nuclear energy is our largest source of carbon-free energy, it is such a critical part of our fight against climate change. But it's also important for other reasons that we'll dive into in this season of the podcast. The guests on this podcast range from kicking off with Miss America to nuclear influencers and communicators to policy experts. So there are a lot of people that we're going to talk to that are not scientists and engineers. They're out there in the nuclear world in different capacities. I am so excited to have Grace, our Miss America from 2023 on the podcast today. She is such a cool person. She's brilliant. She's beautiful. She was so fun to talk to. I never thought that I would be talking about Miss America being a nuclear energy advocate. It is, it's so fun. It's really wild to me. I actually did pageants when I was a kid, something that I don't talk about often because I clearly never made the Miss America level, but I loved doing it. I was a dancer, so it was a great way to kind of practice my dance skills. And if middle school Mary knew that one day she would be interviewing Miss America, she would be freaking out. (laughs) Mary, that's amazing. I had no idea. That is so cool. I have some crowns, some big trophies. I want to know about the crowns you have. (laughs) How many are there? There's a few. I don't know. Not that many. My favorite one was probably, it's it's literally so tall. It's like probably two feet tall. These crowns when you're a kid are like half your body size. It's, I'm (laughs) I'm absolutely speechless. I I am, (laughs) I'm speechless. This is probably my favorite crown. I did an Easter pageant that has a huge Easter bunny in, in the crown in rhinestones. My mom did pageants back when she was in high school as well. But uh, and she had a couple crowns. They they do not <laughs> sound as exciting as the ones you've just described. The rhinestone Easter bunny. My mom actually did pageants, too. That's how she helped pay for our college. So it's a great scholarship program as well. This is amazing. 
Today we have Grace Stanky, a nuclear engineer, and she was crowned Miss America in 2023. She is now using her platform to advocate for the use of clean energy to create a cleaner future with an emphasis on promoting nuclear energy as a key to a cleaner future for the world. So Grace, you're Miss America. How did you first get involved with pageants? Yeah, I started when I was 13, actually. I had no idea about nuclear. I was still a child. But I was a violinist and I had started competing in local competitions in my in my hometown. And I remember competing and I went up. I forgot my music. I shook at like everything that could have gone wrong went wrong with the performance. So I Googled talent competitions to try and find other resources and other opportunities to perform. And I found the Miss America's Teen program. So I started when I was 13. Started because of my violin, but stayed because of the incredible women I met. I learned interview skills, public speaking skills, uh, and networking capabilities. And it, for me, I was very driven in high school and wasn't necessarily the person that fit in all the time. And it was Miss America was a place where it was cool to be kind. It was cool to be ambitious. It was cool to be driven. Uh, it was cool to be passionate. And all of those things just really kind of culminated together to create this awesome environment. Seems like a lot of young women are now getting involved with pageants to kind of practice their talents. So whether they're dancers or musicians, um, it's a great place to showcase, you know, all the great things that women are doing. So tell us a bit about the process of becoming Miss America. St start from the beginning. I want to hear the whole thing. Like I said, started when I was 13. I competed at the state teen competition and then I was hooked. You know, I was like, all right, I want to go back next year. You also have the option in Wisconsin to compete in local competitions first and then you go to state. So it's kind of like sports in a sense where you have, you know, your conference, your regional, so on and so forth championship things. Uh, it's very similar in the world of Miss America, where I, on the second year I competed, I competed in four local competitions before I won, uh, won the fourth competition, uh, went back to state, and I actually ended up winning the state competition then that year as, the, as a teen. Uh, well, once you compete at the national level, you can only compete once for the national title. So I was done competing as a teen then, uh, and I was only 15 at the time, so I had a lot of time to grow up and to really find who I was outside of the organization. Uh, this is an organization that does, it, a lot of people spend a lot of time preparing for the competition and things like that. But it was really wonderful to have those three years off to find nuclear, to find passions that I was so excited about. The person I was when I was 15 is totally different than the woman I am now. Uh, and I came back when I got into college because I realized college is really, really expensive and Miss America is a scholarship up organization. So uh, I, I started competing again because it was a great way to, to earn some extra money towards school. And, you know, then I then I kept going and all of a sudden now I'm Miss America, which is really, really incredible because I've been able to uh, really highlight my nuclear advocacy to work within the nuclear industry and continue breaking the stereotype that that women can do anything. They can be a nuclear engineer, but they can also be Miss America. So I'm curious, how did you get into nuclear and nuclear engineering? I got into it out of spite. Um, so it's a, I have a really awful origin story. It's not good. I always knew I'd go into engineering. My dad was a civil engineer. I'd watch bridge, bridges get demoed overnight. Uh, and I thought it was the coolest thing in the world to, to design things that, that lead to awesome products, right? Uh, I always loved math. I always loved science. So when it came to touring colleges, I knew engineering was going to be the path for me, but I didn't know what kind. I went to a college, found nuclear engineering, and I thought, man, what a flex it would be to say I'm a nuclear engineer. Like, that was what started it all. I didn't know a single thing about nuclear. The only thing I knew about it was from, like, World War II in history class. Uh, so I went back home, and I was talking to my dad, and I said, hey, dad, so I'm thinking either nuclear or aerospace engineering. And he looks at me, you know, in his full, like, dad voice, and you know exactly what I'm talking about when I say, like, his dad voice, and he goes, Grace... Don't go into nuclear. What does every 16-year-old girl do when her dad tells her not to do something? She goes and does it. So that's that's exactly what happened. I went to school and majored in nuclear engineering. Um, if I hated it, if I learned more about it and hated it, I knew I could change majors. But what kept me in the field and what has made me so passionate about it to this day 
is I learned that nuclear is all around us. You know, I learned that it's what saved my dad's life twice from cancer. I learned that it powers 20% of America. I learned that it's an exit sign, smoke detectors, granite countertops, all of these things that were affecting me in my daily life. But I had no idea it was nuclear science. It frustrated me that the only thing I knew about nuclear was weaponry leading up until that point. And it took me going into this field out of spite. That's absolutely an incredible origin story. I think it's very cool, actually. I'm curious, what does your dad think now? Oh, he's super pro-nuclear. He is like the biggest, I, you think I'm a nuclear advocate? I mean, he goes and to any any place, if somebody asks him about me specifically too, he'll be like, oh my God, well, let me tell you about SMRs. It's this whole thing. So he is very, very supportive of nuclear because he didn't know as well that in his in his world, that his life was saved by nuclear medicine. So he learned just as much as I did when I was going through that process. Tell us a little bit more about that. How did nuclear save his life? Yeah, so my dad was diagnosed twice uh, with Hodgkin's lymphoma cancer. The first time I was was pretty young. It was in most of his lymph nodes. And at that time, it was like very treatable and curable. Uh, radiation treatments and everything. It, it was something that as awful as it sounds, if you're going to get cancer, that was one of the best types to get, which sounds terrible. Uh, but he had the iodine treatments, everything like that, that that would help with with that process. Then he was cleared of it in about like it was fifth or sixth grade for me. And then again, when I got into high school, he they found a little spot that uh, they either didn't catch or something. There was a little bit that that continued to grow throughout the four years between the the first time he went through and then the second time. Uh, so he was officially in remission for four or five years. And then they found out that his spleen had grown to the size of a basketball. And my dad's 6'6". Six, six. He's a big guy, right? Uh, his spleen had grown to the size of a basketball because the cancer was just increasing his spleen. So all of his other organs were shrinking. We we He went in because he wasn't eating anything. And like I said, he's 6'6". Six, six. That's not normal. Um, and he ended up, you know, he had the spleen removed. So all of that big old hunk of cancer was gone. Uh, but there was still a little bit left that that radiation treatments and all of the other beauty of modern medicine uh, helped him helped him get through that. And he's alive, happy, healthy. He just retired a little bit ago uh, and he's he's doing really well. So it's I'm very, very thankful for him to be still in my life, to be alive. And I'm thankful for the the nuclear medicine side to to be a part of playing a role in that. Amazing. I'm so glad you guys had a happy ending. And I think that there can be a lot more happy endings if we support nuclear medicine. Yeah, that's such an important thing to tell because I don't think a lot of people know. I, it's not something that hopefully comes into too many people's lives. So what what's next for you after you're finished serving as Miss America? Do you want to enter the nuclear engineering field or what do you want to do? I love what I do right now is Miss America on the advocacy front. Uh, so that's going to forever be a part of my life, I think. And post Miss America, what I've been doing is look at uh, different companies and say, hey, I want a hybrid role between engineering and advocacy because it's important to build credibility as an engineer, but to also just understand and build engineering intuition because there's a certain level of experience that I will never have if I just went purely advocacy and purely into policy and that sort of thing. Uh, instead, I can spend some time working in some sort of, I'm, I'm personally on the power side of the industry. Uh, because of my dad going through cancer, I struggle going into nuclear medicine research and things like that, just because I think it hits a little bit too close to home. Um, so I, I'm sticking with the power side of things and, you know, I'll, I'll continue pursuing engineering uh, but also do some advocacy work both on the policy front and on external relations and community outreach and things like that. What have you seen as the connection between being Miss America and your passion for nuclear energy? What what doors has that opened for you? The nuclear industry, I think, learned that advocacy is something that is needed. We have so many brilliant, intelligent incredible people working on these highly complex scientific problems and they're solving them. We're on step 20 scientifically, but we're at this barrier where policy only lets us get to step two. Public support only lets us get to step three. 
right? And that's what we need to be focusing on because we have all of this awesome science that is literally capable of curing cancer, but we can't use it. So it it comes into this discussion of how do we communicate? How do we advocate for something, which is a lot of what Miss America is on behalf of the nuclear industry. So it's helped the nuclear industry learn the importance of advocacy, but it's also helped Miss America realize the importance of, of women in STEM, advocating for women's empowerment and things like that. So as Miss America, you have this incredible opportunity to talk to different people, different audiences, younger folks, older folks, all these different people. Um, How do you use this opportunity to share the benefits of nuclear energy with all these different audiences? One of the fatal flaws of the nuclear industry, I think, is we've somehow kind of forgotten about the human side of our industry, where we have all of these, like I said, brilliant, intelligent, awesome people. uh, But at the end of the day, what are our hobbies? You know, what makes us humans? What makes us who we are? We're mothers, daughters, friends. It's about captivating the multiple sides of your personalities to relate to your neighbor who knows nothing about nuclear and to have that open conversation, to create the opportunity for open, curious dialect. That is the most important thing for the nuclear industry that we need to focus on is is embracing curiosity from people and allowing the opportunity to ask questions because it's been a very internal facing industry for so long that we need to start facing externally now. That's so true. And say you're talking to your neighbor who knows nothing about nuclear. Um, They're not familiar with the technology. They don't understand the benefits. How do you explain to them what nuclear energy is? A lot of it is finding ways to talk about it in their daily life. When I work with kindergartners or congressmen, you know, sometimes the same level of intelligence. But anyway, sorry, sorry, y'all. I had to to throw in a joke. I I make it relatable to their daily life. When you take a bite out out of a muffin, you have two parts, but you have all these crumbs that fall out, right? That's just like fission. You have something that's splitting it apart, which in this case, it's you. And then there's all these extra crumbs left behind. Well, that's all your neutrons that are going to be able to be used in a nuclear reactor. Finding ways that the modern day life can be used to describe nuclear processes and to continue to talk about, hey, well, you know, neighbor Jim, did you eat a banana for breakfast this morning? Great. You ingested radiation because there's a naturally occurring isotope in there. Like it's that sort of stuff that makes people realize, oh, wait, why am I scared of this? You know, I I deal with this every day. Uh, And that's something that's a really powerful tool I've learned. You've been going around the country now and seeing new technology on the horizon. What are you seeing or what have you seen that excites you the most? I'm excited for my generation to start taking control, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, It's something that young people bring about a very unique perspective where we grew up with politicians who make empty promises. We grew up with this impending doom of climate change. We grew up wanting to do better than our parents. Uh, And I am so excited to see as the workforce continues to turn over, as people who are currently in the workforce plant those important first seeds to watch the nuclear industry grow, to watch this political climate change in support of nuclear. We need that to be happening right now and today. I'm not saying like get rid of everybody that's in the industry right now. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I'm excited for fresh perspectives and fresh approaches with a high drive to follow through and a high drive to hold people accountable. That is the one thing I am so excited for uh, because we are seeing so many different types of technology. We are seeing so many different types of of nuclear science come to light, whether it's SMRs, micro reactors, fast breeder reactors, all of these different things that are starting to happen. We need that high drive and that level of accountability in order to make those things actually come to life and be successful. So how do we get these young people, the next generation, young women interested in working in nuclear? Make nuclear cool again. You know, that's that's all that's (laughs) what I'm trying to do right now. Uh, Nuclear isn't just a bunch of people that sit there and do math all day. That's not what our industry is. Like I said, I, I, I hammer this home where. It's talking about how it's a part of our everyday lives, how your neighbor probably is involved in nuclear some way or just went to the doctor and got treated by some form of nuclear medicine. Uh, It's something that I think people don't know what this science does for them. And 
I do a lot to teach people about how nuclear science is improving their everyday lives. And that typically changes a lot of perspectives when it comes to the nuclear world overall. We need to make nuclear cool again t-shirts. I would love that. You know, I've, <laughs> I've thought about it for like after this year is done, starting a little merch line for nuclear stuff. I don't know. It'd be cool. <laughs> yeah, I'd buy it. I, I would buy it. <laughs> So you mentioned that you are more interested in the power side, energy side. Speaking to our audience, where we have listeners who don't know anything about nuclear, talk about, in your opinion, why you think nuclear energy is so important for our future. When I first majored in this, I'm like, oh, gosh, what am I going to do with my career here? Uh, And it really felt like the only options were medicine and power. Like that felt like the only two options. But at the end of the day, I'm from Wisconsin, right? Agriculture uses nuclear science so much. Research is a huge portion of it. Deep space, military contracting. Like there are so many awesome things to get involved in within the nuclear world that I just, I can't say enough about that. And it's about finding the thing that's the best fit for you. So I think that's really awesome about the nuclear world is that you're not stuck just doing one thing. Uh, it's, It's really a diverse field in that sense. But to answer the question about why is why is nuclear energy important, one of the most important things about America and the global shift in our energy production, I think, are two things, depending on what you care about. One, climate change is a pressing issue. That has been one of the number one political issues for so many years now. Uh, so we need a switch to zero carbon energy. Now, that brings me to the second point. We need reliable energy. We are at the point where, uh, you know, in Texas a couple of years ago, they lost power in the middle of winter. 200 people died because they lost heat. They lost electricity. We are a society, especially here in America. I will say this is this is America and other further developed countries. We're a society that relies upon electricity. I'll, I'll admit if I didn't have lights and Google, I would not be able to survive on my own, most likely. I'm with you. The thing about nuclear energy is it's zero carbon and it's reliable. It is almost always on. It is one of the most reliable forms of electricity that we have to date. And that is just something that I don't see why we wouldn't keep building more of that. Because as we slowly start to switch over to zero carbon and clean energy, unfortunately, you know, I'm from Wisconsin. Solar doesn't really cut it because we don't get the sun for like six months of the year during winter. Uh, That it's not a reliable, always available power source. And the technology required to develop that is going to take years. And why should we wait for that technology to develop when we could be building nuclear right now to provide that baseload source of power that's reliable, that's always on, that's safe, that's effective, that requires small land usage, that is, is just so, you know, it's 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 one of the best ways of producing electricity that we have today. Well, you mentioned all these different uses for it, too. And you mentioned agriculture. Dive into that a little bit. Yeah. So like your seasonings that you keep in the cabinet, the reason that you don't need to refrigerate them or, you know, why the basil plant that I have right now picking off the leaves fresh. Well, those leaves don't last. But the reason they last in the jars is because they're actually a little they go through some nuclear science stuff. I'll be honest, I don't know the exacts of it, uh, but I'm pretty sure they irradiate some of that those those seasonings to get them to stay that long. Uh, when it comes to growing the actual plants, it's frequently used in replacement of pesticides in a way that's that's better than pesticides. It's got less harmful effects on the environment uh, and helps helps with crop growth overall. And I would say also when it comes to the power discussion too, when you have such a an effective power generator within a nuclear power plant, you use such a small amount of land to create thousands of megawatts of power. Well, now you can use more land for agriculture and for growing fa- for growing food rather than using it for solar panel fields. Because at the end of the day, our population is growing. That means our food demands are going to grow. Our electricity demands are going to grow. And we need housing space. So land is going to become such a crucial capital uh, as as time goes on, in my opinion. And I'm, I'm hoping that nuclear is a part of, of helping the agriculture industry support that growing population. That's an incredible point, especially about land use and how smaller the, the footprint of a nuclear plant is compared with some other sources of energy. That It's really great that you tied, tied that together. I'm curious when you're out there talking 
to all the people you've had the amazing chance to speak with, are you are you hearing any pushback or hesitation from any of these audiences? One thing I think is unusual right now is people are, I would say, cautious. They're open to the discussion, but they're cautious and they're hesitant uh, because they're like, I think, you know, it's zero carbon, so it's got to be good, but also bombs, but also waste. You know, they have all of these sort of stereotypes and all of these these things that people are are worried about. and But they're open to ask the question, well, Grace, what about the waste? And that's an opportunity for me to say, hey, you know, we know what to do with the waste scientifically. Look at France. They recycle 80% of their spent nuclear fuel. In addition to the problem of waste, your entire lifetime, the amount of waste that you would produce from your entire life being powered by nuclear energy would be the size of a soda can. Throughout the past 60 years in America, all of the nuclear waste from powering 20% of the country fits inside of a Walmart. That in and of itself goes to show, yes, waste is something that we know what to do, but at the end of the day, it is so much significantly smaller than any other form of industry. In addition to, we actually know where our waste is. Many other forms of energy production, they have no standards, no expectations for how to manage or what to do with their waste when they're done producing power and they have harmful byproducts we're the only industry that actually takes care of it. Um, and that says a lot about what we do and the standard of excellence that we have in the power generation industry. What other myths or disinformation are you hearing that you're working to correct? Safety is another big concern, um, which I think that's something the nuclear industry has been battling since it was born, right? Because when it was born, it was weaponry. Uh, and then it became power production. But at the end of the day, I, I like to compare the nuclear industry, 60 years of global operations. There have been three major disasters with a very limited amount of deaths at the end of the day. Compare that to here in America, just, just the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, right? Just that. I would say more people died in that scenario than all of nuclear operating history. That says something about the standard that we have. We are per percentage, the safest form of energy production. I think the only one that comes close is hydroelectric uh, for employees to work in. It's something that is, the science is there, the technology is there. Uh, our standard of excellence really holds everybody accountable to producing clean energy for a cleaner future. Do you feel like when you're talking to these different audiences that your explanations that you're giving them are well-received? I would say yes. There's always going to be a couple of people out there in the world. And at that point, you know what? That's okay. Uh, I'll wait until they're a little bit more open to the conversation. Uh, but it's honestly, when I walk into a room, my goal isn't to change the whole entire world. It's just to make the one connection. It doesn't take convincing every single person I talk to to support nuclear. It's about convincing the one person that might become the next president of the United States and getting them to support it and getting people engaged, people excited about it, people curious about it. Uh, a lot of what I do with, with both kids and nursing home residents and congressmen alike, spark the curiosity, get them interested enough that they're Googling it on their own after I'm done talking to them. That's what I want to do. And I find that that does happen a lot. I have a lot of people send me messages on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, wherever it might be after I've been at an appearance and they say, hey, you know, I've got a follow up. I want to keep talking. Uh, and that's that's exciting to see. That is incredible to hear, you know, just that you're able to pique people's interest enough that they want to keep having a conversation. If there are people listening right now who are interested in getting into advocacy themselves, what do you recommend? What's what's the first step people can take to advocate for nuclear? First of all, get comfortable with public speaking and being able to handle, you know, the 20 questions game. I, I highly recommend the greatest place to start is Thanksgiving dinner. You know, it is the best place to start when it comes to advocacy. So true. <laughs> so it really true. is. You know, because your family can't get mad. Like they can get mad at you, but they still have to love you. Just start small. 
you know, reach out to a Girl Scout troop. That's a group of 20 little girls, which sometimes is terrifying. Okay. Sometimes they are (laughs) like, oh my God, what did I get myself into? Whether it's little girls that you like working with kids and the youth that you want to work with them specifically, or maybe you want to work with politicians specifically. Well, great. Set up a poster board day, sit outside the Capitol in your state and answer questions to people walking by about nuclear energy. Or go into the offices and try and, you know, lobby, essentially. Uh, There are so many different ways that once you feel like you've kind of gone through the basics of, well, what about the waste? Well, what about, you know, nonproliferation? What about the safety of it all? What about the costs? Like, once you get those four things pretty comfortably like you can comfortably talk about them, you're pretty much set to talk to the general public. Like that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, If I was able to do it as a 17 year old who had just started in the field, I think everybody else can too. There is nobody that's unqualified. There is nobody that uh, is, is less important of an advocate than others because your story might resonate differently than my story does with an audience. I might be able to convince 10% of the people in a room to, to support nuclear, but you might be able to convince 20% because of your story and what you have to tell. Uh, so that's a really incredible thing to keep in mind as, as you look into advocacy. And I'm always a resource. Send me a, send me a DM, send me a message. I'll gladly help out. So I have to ask, you mentioned competitive water skiing at the beginning. Tell me about that. How did you get started in competitive water skiing? And are you still doing it while you're Miss America? I can't do it while I'm Miss America, unfortunately, Um, just because of college and everything and timing. It just doesn't work out as much as I would like it to. But I am still doing it when I can, right? Uh, When I'm able to go out and just water ski for fun. Uh, But got into it when I got into college. I only really started water skiing about five years ago. And when I went to college, I was like, oh, hey, this is fun. I enjoy it. I'm going to join this club team. And next thing you know, you know, two years later, I was skiing at the Division I national competition for the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, so it, it really has been a wild ride, but it's a good group of people that are supportive, that are loving, that are caring. Uh, nobody's ever mad when they're on a boat, too. So, you know, it's always a good time. It's always a ton of fun. Uh, and I, I really have loved it and grown to thoroughly enjoy the sport. It's one of my favorite ways, especially in the summer, to, to just relax. Grace, you're making me feel like anything I go out and try and do today, I can do and conquer and be successful at. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, I I think one of my perspectives and like, this is so weird because I'm a whopping 21 years old, right? I would not say I'm wise, but one of the best things that I've I've learned is I'm not going to do it if it doesn't bring me joy, right? If If it doesn't bring me happiness, if I don't feel fulfilled at the end of the day, I'm not, you know, why, why should I spend my time doing it? Um, And especially when it comes to like hobbies and everything like that, that definitely applies. Obviously work there's, I can't like go up to my boss and be like, "Mm, I don't really feel like doing it today. (laughs) That doesn't, that doesn't fully fly. Um, But the broad perspective of supporting the mission of nuclear, I will always enjoy. That is something that will always bring me joy in life and, and make me happy. Um, So that's just like, as long as you're having fun, as long as you're living life and you're smiling, what else? You know, that's it. That's truly amazing, Grace. Really a, a great outlook to have. And I, it's something that I hope everyone listening uh, takes to heart. From a whopping 21-year-old. <laughs> no, it's brilliant, though. It is I brilliant. Was, it's I wish true. I realized that when I was 21. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. do things that make you happy. Life is short. It's... I I think you've made a great point that you're never too young to have impact. So, no, you may not have the life experience of somebody who's about to retire from the nuclear industry, but every voice has value to share. And I, I think that's one of the most important things that you're putting forth with your platform. And it is a big thing. That's a lot of the times when I work with nuclear professionals, I'm like, listen, y'all are asking me how I'm doing this. I'm If I was, like I said, 17 and had just started my degree, imagine how much knowledge and experience you can bring to the table after working in the industry for, 10, for 5, 10, 20, 40 years, however long it's been. Uh, that's something that I think people always underestimate their own skills and capabilities, but you have the skills, you have the capabilities, you have the knowledge and the ability to do this. So just go do it, right? That's it. <laughs> 
Nike, sponsor me. Come on. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. That can go on a t-shirt too. <laughs> We're going to have a little t-shirt line by the end of this episode. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so Grace, in one word, describe the future of nuclear energy. Innovative. I think the biggest thing is, is we're changing how things are done. We're changing, not just on the technology side of things, do I describe as innovative? Um, because that, holy crap, the level of innovation that's going on on the technology side is insane to begin with, right? But the people are innovative. As challenges arise, we're ready to solve them. As people look and see the issues that are happening, we're ready to be there to to tackle those issues, to create new designs, new technologies, new strategies, to to bring in new types of people and new types of problems, right? Like it's it's just so incredible the level of innovation uh, that the nuclear industry has moving forward. That's on the energy front, the medicine front, the agriculture front, on all of those fronts that it's truly going to be a big part of the world moving forward. I love that. It is such an exciting time for the industry and, you know, for the contributions that the industry is going to make to the world. And I'm curious, what innovations and technology are you most excited about? Oh, I mean, I am excited about SMRs. I think everyone is a little bit. Uh, so those are small modular reactors for the listeners that are like, what is she talking about? I want to know if you're, are you taking your dad out on the road with you to advocate now that you've brought him over to Team Nuclear? You know, so Miss America, unfortunately, my parents are not allowed to travel with me, but they have come with to a couple of appearances. I, My dad came with me to the Point Beach Nuclear Power Plant. We did a tour there here in Wisconsin. And it was so funny because he's a civil engineer guy, right? We're walking around and, you know, we're looking at the spent fuel pool and nuclear people like me are, you know, looking at, okay, well, that one's shiny. So that one was just brought in. Like, you know, looking at all of these different things, like, okay, that's probably the oldest bundle in this pool, that sort of thing. And he's just sitting there. And he looks at the tour guide. He goes, what type of concrete is this? I'm like, who is asking this question? <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> so it's so fun because obviously, like, that's his area of expertise. And he's like, for it to be, you know, sitting here with water on it for 40 years in and of itself is like a huge, huge thing. There's no cracks. He's like, I don't understand this. Uh, so it's it's neat because that also speaks to the the fact that a nuclear power plant is not made by nuclear engineers. It's it's designed and the process is there, but this is something that creates a whole team of people and requires a whole team of people. The The first time I went to a nuclear power plant, my first time ever seeing one, um, I was like, okay, it's just like a box of a building from the outside. It can't be that cool. You know, I'm like, it's not really going to be that exciting. Driving in, like I saw, I saw the, 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 the domes for the reactor heads. And like, I was, I was immediately like, I almost started crying in the car. I was like, this is so cool. This is so awesome. Um, so I'm sitting there alone. I genuinely pulled over and took like a picture of the reactors and everything. <laughs> it was the most weird experience, but I, I, I look back at that moment and I think the most exciting thing about that is knowing that it was a team of people of not just nuclear engineers, of mechanical, of civil, of chemists, of physicists, of communicators, of marketing people, of politicians that made this incredible engineering design happen. And that's just like, that's just the beauty of nuclear, right? If if you get sick of one thing, great, you can go do something else because we need everyone in this field. We need everyone on board, no matter what your interest is. A lot of what I do on the recruitment front is not necessarily saying, hey, you, you there should be a nuclear engineer. A lot of it is just what's your passion? What brings you joy, right? Do you like talking to people? Great. You should go into like communications because we need communications people. We need external relations. Do you like politics? Great. Be a politician that supports nuclear. Uh, there's always a place for everyone, no matter your interest, no matter your passion, no matter your joy. And that's an incredible thing about the nuclear industry is there's a place for everyone. That's so true. There's a place for everyone. And there's going to be so many new jobs as nuclear grows and all these new technologies are built. So it's a great industry for our young people to start looking at. All right. Oh my gosh, thank you. This has been yes. so fun. Thanks for all you are doing yeah. on behalf of the industry. Seriously. Oh, I try. It's amazing. <laughs> I just had fun. <laughs> Good. <laughs> thank you, Grace, for coming on the show today. 
What a great way to kick off the podcast. An awesome conversation. If you want to hear more from Grace, you can follow her on Instagram and Twitter at Grace Stanky. And thanks to all of you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and leave your feedback to the podcast on whatever platform you're listening on. See you next time.